A blessed Sabbath to everyone. We will praise the Lord with hymn number 194. 194. It is titled, Heir of the Kingdom. We are heirs to the Kingdom of God. Heir of the Kingdom 194. Let's arise and sing, please. One hundred ninety-four. Here of the kingdom of shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. 
Behold the place where they lay him. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said. Thank you for the opportunity what you have given us to gather together and praise your name. Please bless your word and bless the brother who is presenting us uh, that. And please uh, help us uh, uh, through your Holy Spirit to understand and to follow on in our daily basis. Please uh, give us strength because we are uh, powerless, but we are powerful. Mm -hmm and remain with us. Forgive our sins and mistakes, and uh, help us uh, all over the world for your children to, to raise in, up spiritually uh, with us and to, to praising your name in all our life. All the things we ask in the dear name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And maybe. We want to welcome a number of you today to our worship service. Very happy to have Sister Wendy Eaton with us from Canada. And we're very happy also to have with us Pastor Laszlo and his wife and his wife's cousin and his son David. May the Lord bless you richly. And on this rainy day in Cedar Town, I hope that there will be sunshine in our souls. We have fellowship lunch today, and you're all invited to accompany us here in the fellowship hall. I have a story for the children. If they will come forward, I want to tell them a story.
Happy Sabbath to you. Can you say Happy Sabbath really loud? Happy Sabbath! I guess you can. Well, I have something in my bag that I want to show you. And I have something in my pocket I want to take out to show you. And I want to tell you a story about a little boy. Uh, there's one little boy here with us. And this little boy was a German little boy. And he liked to play with his friends. But he also liked to play alone, this little boy. And he would go to the trees, these big trees that were close to his house, and he would bring a knife. He liked to carry around a knife. You know, little boys a like knife. a pocket knife. Yes. And he liked to carve into that tree letters. Just letters. Like liked to carve into the tree letters. Well, that little boy had a father, and his father was a goldsmith. That means a person that works with gold and makes chains of gold and rings of gold and bracelets of gold. And this little boy thought, well, why don't I make letters of metal, letters of metal? You know, my little Shiloh, I'm looking for Shiloh. Where's Shiloh? Shiloh, come. Shiloh is learning her letters. And she knows how to spell some words. And she joins these letters together. Well, this little boy was learning the letters. And he liked to write the letters on the tree. And when he grew up, he said, well, why don't I make letters out of metal? Metal. He wanted to make letters out of metal. And then he went farther and thought, why don't I make words out of metal, sentences out of metal, just by taking those little letters made out of, letter, of metal and putting them next to each other, like these building blocks. That little boy grew up to be Johannes Gutenberg. Johannes Gutenberg. And in 1453, he printed the first book in the history of Europe. The first book. And it all started since he was a little boy playing with his pocket knife and carving letters on a tree. Well, I have in my pocket, I said I have two things to show you. I'm going to show you what I have in my pocket. And this is a stamp from 1952. Any of you were born in 1952? <laughs> that was last century. That was a long time ago. 1952. Well, in 1452, 1452, it says the, by 1952, it was the 500th anniversary. So we are 451 year no 551 years since he printed the bible 551 years and the first book he printed was the bible it says the 500th anniversary of the printing of the first book the holy bible from movable type by johannes gutenberg and you can see him there with his friends he hired a carpenter to make him this machine, this big machine. I've seen a replica of the big machine. And then he put his metal letters one next to another like a building block. And he started to print and print pages. And then with those pages, he printed a book. And I have a copy of the book that he printed. There's only 40 of them in the world right now. And this is a copy, an exact copy. It's called the Gutenberg Bible. This is the New Testament. And look at it. It has these gothic letters. They're so, so pretty, so long. 42 lines in every single column. Four columns, 42 lines, and they were designed and painted in color. This was 
the first Bible of the people. He changed the way Europeans thought. And this was the beginning of the Renaissance. This was the beginning of the rebirth of Europe. The printing of the Bible. The first book ever printed in Europe was the Bible. And they have made a stamp here in the United States to commemorate. If you want to see an original copy, you can go to several places. You can go to the Library of Congress in Washington. You can go to Harvard University. You can go to Yale University. Or you can come to my house and see replicas of the books. May the Lord bless you. And may you, listen, may you be part of God's printing press. You know what God's going to do in the last days? He's putting together the letters of Jesus' new name. And he's going to print it on the forehead of every little girl and every little boy that believes on him. And every adult that believes in Jesus is going to have their name imprinted. It will be like a tattoo that only God sees. No human sees. And it will have the name of Jesus. You know why? Because God sees Jesus in your life. God is into the business of printing. And he wants to print the name of Jesus in your forehead. May the Lord bless you. And may you enjoy the service today. Amen. missionary that went to Turkey and was trying to present the message to those that believe in Islam would tell the following illustration. He would say, imagine you're traveling somewhere and you really want to get there. And after traveling for some time, you come to a fork in the road, a crossroads. And there are two paths. One to the right, one to the left. And you don't know which way to go. There is no sign. But there are two people on that fork. And you can ask one of them which way to go. One of them is dead. And the other is alive. Who would you ask? The live person. Of course. But how is it that millions of our race, of our human race, ask a dead prophet who is not alive. We want to ask someone who is alive. Jesus Christ is alive. We can ask Him the way. And He says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Listen to me. When Muhammad died, Omar, who was one of the caliphs, stood up and took his sword and said, If any man says that Muhammad is dead, I will cut his head off. But after saying that, he says, I believe Muhammad will resurrect. But the days went on and Muhammad didn't resurrect. And his place is in Medina. He's buried. But go to where Jesus is buried, in the garden tomb. And you'll see the epitaph there that says, he is not here. He is not here. 
He is alive. He's resurrected. This is the story of Mark chapter 16, please. If you'll turn with me. In Mark chapter 16, these women were coming to the garden tomb. They were coming from different directions. Johanna, Salome, the mother of Jesus, the other Mary that was the sister of Mary. All these were coming from different directions to the garden tomb. The first one to arrive was Mary Magdalene. She came there and she saw the stone had been moved. And she felt the despair. She said within herself, someone has stolen the body of Christ. And she runs back to tell Peter and John, Look, somebody stole the body of Jesus. And Peter and John come running and they come to the tomb. John beats them because he's faster. He's younger. He can run faster. You know, as we age, we lose speed. I can tell you from personal experience. We lose some other things. We lose some teeth, and some hair, some sleep some memory. And John entered first at that tomb and he stuck his head inside and he, but he didn't want to go in. Then Peter came, he was a little, had a little more experience, was a little braver and Peter went in and he looked and then John came in and John believed. Now in between the coming of Peter and John and in between the time that Mary goes to get Peter and John, these other women show up. They say they come bringing spices very early in the morning. And they said among themselves, we're reading Mark chapter 16, verse 3. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? I want to talk about the stone and the spices. That's the title I want to give the service. The stone and the spices. These women are carrying these spices. Maybe leather bags with spices. Or, or maybe they're in these, these uh, clay containers, vessels that they're carrying. Small ones, maybe big ones. They're oils, perfume oils, these spices they're carrying. All these women from different points. They agreed to meet at the tomb. But they're thinking, and some of them are coming in pairs. Maybe the other Mary with Mary, they stayed together overnight. And they're coming and they have a question. Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Who's going to roll the stone? There was a bishop in Liverpool in the 1800s, in the late 1800s, his name was Dr. Riley. He wrote a commentary on the first four Gospels. And what he says is fascinating. He says, what a, striking, what a striking emblem we have in this simple narrative of the experience of many Christians. These women coming to the tomb are an emblem, an example of many Christians today. How often, how often, do Christians believe and are oppressed and cast down because they anticipate a difficulty? They anticipate an evil. The story of these women is the story of all Christians. We go our path, we're looking for Jesus. And we have worries and we have anxiety. Who's going to roll the stone? We have these stones in our life. We worry maybe I'm going to be fired. I'm going to lose my job. We worry maybe I will be rejected in this love relationship. We worry maybe I will be attacked. Maybe I'm going to lose my house. Or maybe my loved one is going to die. Or I'm going to be disabled. Lord, if I go there, I'm going to be lost. We have all these worries. I'm going to fail my test. 
I mean, I went through university thinking I would never finish. <laughs> I would sit down to take tests, not knowing if I would pass, but I just went through the rhythms, maybe. We worry. I wonder if some women went back, that they didn't reach the tomb. I don't know. I don't know. Mark Twain, who was our famous American writer, says, I have sweated through many difficulties which never occurred. Many difficulties. He sweated, you know, when, when you're really worried and you start to sweat, oh, and your hands sweat and your mouth fries up and your pupils get big, oh no, what's going to happen? You know, you're going for this job interview, what's, you know, you're just dreading it. Things that we dread in life. But should the Christian really be like that? We read in the scriptures here, verse 4, And when they looked, they saw the stone was rolled away. And it was very great. We have these great stones in our life that impede our work, that stop us seemingly from our task. But when we look, when we look with faith, we need to have the faith. And when we look with faith, then we will see the stones moved away. Like when Isaac came to his father and said, Father, we have the fire. We have, what else? The wood. The stones are up there on the mountain. But where is the sacrifice? And Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. We must have that faith that God is going to provide. He's going to send an angel to move the stone. In eternity, we will have an opportunity to sit with our guardian angel. And he's going to tell us the many times he came down from heaven to move the stones in our path. To remove them. You know, there was a greater stone in their path that the women didn't realize. There had been soldiers there in front of the tomb. Why didn't they ask who's going to remove the soldiers? There may have been a hundred soldiers with a centurion in front of that tomb. Roman soldiers armed. They would not allow those women to pass. But they didn't know. God had already taken care of it. They were the first ones to run away before the women arrived. There are many problems that God doesn't reveal to us that He will take care of. That he will solve in his way. Through his angels. He sends angels from heaven like he sent them to the tomb. And those troublemakers will flee away. Dr. Riley says, Difficulties which Christians fear will sometimes disappear as they approach them. The woman continued. They didn't know the answer. But they continued by faith. They looked and the stone was rolled away. I want to encourage you this morning to fulfill your mission of seeking for Jesus. These women were looking for Jesus. We need to look for Jesus. And there may be problems in the way. Maybe we are tempted, if I start keeping the Sabbath, I'm going to lose my job. Maybe you will, but God will give you a better job. We need to face our problems and approach them, is the moral of the story with the stones. We need to face it, not run away. You know, these women, they approached the sepulcher. And I want the children to pay attention because I'm going to talk about baseball in a moment. 
In verse 5 it says, And entering into the sepulcher, into the tomb, into the garden tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. They were scared. There were actually two young men. There were two of them. Two young men. And these two young men were angels. Uh, Luke and John says that they were two angels. Mark and Matthew only mention one. But there were two. But Mark and Matthew just mention one of them. And as they enter the sepulcher, they become scared. And what do the angels say? Verse 6. And he saith unto them, Be not scared. Fear not. Be not affrighted. With the children of Cedar Christian School, we've been playing baseball. And many times when the girls go to bat and they see the ball pitch, they will swing, boom, and they'll hit the ball. But the ball will go right into the pitcher's glove. It'll roll into the pitcher and the pitcher goes down. He picks up the ball and these girls are halfway to the base and they stop running and they turn back. And what have I told them? I've said, don't give up. Run to first base. You don't know what's going to happen. The pitcher may drop the ball. You know, when he goes to pick it up with his glove, it may fall from his glove. The pitcher may overthrow the first base. The first baseman may drop the ball. And you can make it on time to first base. Maybe you don't understand baseball. I don't know if they play baseball in Hungary. But we play a lot of baseball in the United States and also in Canada. The thing is that when a child, when someone is playing baseball and they hit the ball, they need to run from where they hit the ball to a base. to the, And they shouldn't think that, no, why run if they're going to get me out? Let me put it in your context. Let's say you're playing soccer. Okay? And you have the ball. And you see the goal. And you're going to run towards the goal to kick the ball. But there in front of you is Maradona. You know, this great football player. (laughs) He's going to stop you. You're not going to be able to kick it in. You have this great goalie there. So what do you do? You say, oh no, I'm going to leave the ball. I'm going to go away. You can't do that. You need to try to come close and kick the ball. You don't know. Maybe Maradona will trip and fall. Maybe the goalie will miss the ball when you try to stop it and the goal will go in. We need to have faith that God will take care of our difficulties. We cannot be afraid. Be not afraid. President Franklin D. Roosevelt in addressing the nation after Pearl Harbor after Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese, said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Now listen to me before my time is up. This angel had a message. And I want to divide it in three parts. And I want to compare it to the three angels' messages because I'm talking to Seventh-day Adventists and Reformers. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, fear not. What is the first angel's message? Fear God and give Him glory and seek Him who created the heavens and the earth for His hour of judgment is come. This message of the angel is like the first angel's message. Fear not. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the great creator. Jesus created the heavens and the earth. 
There is nothing in the universe that Jesus did not create. We need to seek our creator. I think about children who have been adopted. That when they reach a certain age, they want to look for their biological parents. And they seek, they want to find them. And when they find them, they become disappointed. They become disappointed. No, I don't want to meet them again. You know, our biological parents disappointed us. They led us into sin. They gave us death as an inheritance. And Jesus has adopted us into His family, into the family of God. And we need to stop seeking our biological parents. We need to stop seeking the world. And follow Christ and thank Him. Ye seek Christ. And that is the first angel's message. We need to fear God. We need to give Him glory. For the hour of His judgment has come. Seek Him who created everything. Who has provided everything for us. Even as foster parents provide everything for their children. Now there's another angel's message. And we find it here as a seed. The angel said, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. He's not here. He's not in Babylon. Babylon is fallen. Babylon is a symbol of all the false religions on earth. Don't look for the answer in the fallen churches in Babylon. Don't go to the independent movements. They don't have the answer. In the book, Early Writings... Sister White wrote that there will be independent Adventist groups in the end of time. And each of them will have a little bit of the truth. But God's people, His remnant people have all the truth. He's not there. Don't go to the empty tomb. Those are empty tombs. And people are going in trying to find something new. They're not. Babylon is empty. Babylon is fallen. It's in ruins. Go to Iraq and you'll see it's in ruins. It will never be rebuilt. A church that falls can never be rebuilt spiritually. Understand that. It cannot. It is lost forever. He is not there. He is not here. Behold the place. Where they laid him. You have the wrappings. The proof that he may have been there in the past. There are churches that were once God's people. And you find the wrappings of the cloths. The evidence that yes he was there. But centuries ago not today. And then the angel goes on and says. In verse 7. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. The angel tells them they need to do something. They need to go and tell the disciples that Jesus is alive. They need to tell Peter who fell away. Peter, you need to come back. He goes before you into Galilee. You know... This is the message of the third angel that's announcing the return of Christ in glory. Maybe we need to program ourselves every day that we may reflect upon the coming of Christ. Our brains. That we may hear the sound. That Jesus is coming and put everything in context. The third angel's message is don't worship the beast nor his image. Don't receive its mark. Don't worship on the day of the beast. But keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Because Jesus is coming. The last part of the third angel's message is the coming of Christ. He comes with his in glory. To gather his own. 
But there's something else I want us to think about, please. If we go to verse 1, and when uh, ch- we're in Mark chapter 16, verse 1, it says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had bought sweet spices that they may anoint him, that they might come and anoint him. What happened to the spices? What happened? Did they need the spices? No, Jesus wasn't there. He wasn't dead. He was dead in their thoughts. What did they do with these vessels, with these bags, with all these spices, with all these oils? You know, the Gospels doesn't tell us. But maybe they forgot them. They put them aside. Remember the, the woman who came to the well in Samaria, the Samaritan woman? She had her big pitcher and she was going to fill it with water and she met Jesus, the living water. The Bible says she left her pitcher and she ran quickly to tell everyone in the city, I have met Messiah, come and meet him. Remember Bartimaeus, the blind man? He had a cloak to cover him and when they said, get up, Jesus has called you. He left his cloak and he went to Jesus. This was exciting news. I believe they left the spices. That's my personal feeling. I don't think they carried these big vessels back to go tell the disciples, look, no, this is great news. This is like winning the lottery. Better than that. Because people that win the lottery win big problems in their lives. Read the stories of people who win the lottery. It's awful. You have a whole bunch of family that shows up you've never heard about. All the sin fighting for the money. But with Christ, it's not like that. You can share Christ. You can have as many family appear as possible. You can add people to the family of Christ. The spices were left aside. They had found a better spice of life. The good news of the resurrection of Jesus. What spices are you willing to leave for Jesus today? Maybe it's friends. Maybe it's music. Maybe that music you used to listen to was like a spice. You know, these spices give a... uh, They have reactions. I think about the East, the spices in the East that give all this heat. They change the way we feel, the way we think. We need to abandon the worldly music, the worldly friends. Maybe it's vices and drugs. Or maybe it's something good. There are good spices also. But they stand between us and God. We need to abandon them also. Whatever good or bad that interferes in your spiritual development must be laid aside. And I'm going to prove it with the Scriptures. Come with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing ye also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, lay aside all the weights, and the sin that doth so easily beset us. So there are weights, And there are sins. Both of them we need to leave aside. They stop us from running and sharing the good news. The Bible says here, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which thus so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author, and finisher of our faith. I have been listening to these CDs by Focus on the Family about the life of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce was an orphan. 
praised by his uncle and aunt and taught by the famous preacher John Newton. John Newton became his mentor. Wilberforce became a member of parliament in England, one of the greatest orators of his time. He probably met Benjamin Franklin when Benjamin Franklin was in France. He was a very rich man, this William Wilberforce, very powerful speaker. He's buried at Westminster Abbey. Remember Persia? We saw his sculpture. He's, there's a big monument of him in Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey is the great cathedral in London. Well, I want to tell you that William Wilberforce, although raised a Christian, became sort of an agnostic when he was in Parliament. But he meets an old school friend named Isaac. And Isaac has become a lecturer, a teacher in Queen's College at Cambridge University. He became a minister. He was an ordained minister, this Isaac. And he starts to challenge Wilberforce to return to the faith. And so William Wilberforce pays for him to go to France with him. They're in France. And they're debating back and forth. And this is what Wilberforce says. He really repeats the thoughts of many people today. Wilberforce says, look, I believe in Christ. I believe that he was a good man, that he had good teaching. He was a wise man. And that if we follow his teachings, we would be better people. And I do believe they killed him. But I don't believe he was the son of God. I don't believe this idea of all these miracles. This was added on through the centuries. So Isaac confronts Wilberforce and says, well, so you do believe in Christ? And he says, yes. Well, how do you know about Jesus? He says, because of the Bible. So you believe the testimony of the good things that Jesus said? You believe his words, right? And he says, yes, I believe the words of Jesus. Now think with me, Wilberforce. Isaac told him. You believe in such phrases as loving your enemies, right? And forgiving 70 times 7. And the golden rule, treating others as you would like others to treat you. And he says, yes, of course. But that same Jesus also said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am one with the Father. How could a good and just man say those things if they weren't true? Then Isaac becomes a little funny and he says, Imagine, William, that I tell you, let us collect alms, money to help the poor. Let's build a house for the orphans. You would say, oh, that's good. I, I believe in that. And then I add on and say, I am a peach tree. Okay, and I am going to give fruit as peaches. And what you need to do is give me money and I will give you peaches because I'm a peach tree. What would you think of me then, William? A peach tree, an orange tree. We need to say peach because we're in Florida. I mean, in, in Georgia, I would say orange if we're in Florida. An apple tree. Wouldn't you say I'm crazy? How can I say I'm an apple tree? Jesus said more than that. And Jesus says that we not only need to give him our funds, but we need to give him our devotion, our worship. We need to give him our lives. He said he was God. He was the tree of life. And those that come to him may eat of the fruit of life. Boy, that really shook William Wilberforce to the bones. And when he came back to England together with Isaac, 
Who do you think William Wilberforce looked for? He looked for his old teacher, John Newton. I want you to know that William Wilberforce was a vegetarian. And he advocated for animal rights. And he became a Christian. A wholehearted Christian. Confessing his sins. Believing in Jesus as the Son of God. And so he testified. And so he worked his entire life then, after his conversion, his reconversion against slavery and outlaw, outlawing slavery in England. And so as we study the resurrection of Christ, we can summarize it in two simple phrases of the messages of the angels which is the summary of the three angels' messages. We go back to Mark chapter 16, and this is what we need to do today. They said to these women, in verse 6, Behold the place where they laid Him. Come! And look, come and see. Come and see the place where they laid him. And this is what we need to tell people. Come and see. Come and see at church. Invite them to church. And the other thing the angel said is in verse 7. Come and see, they told the women. Come into the sepulcher. And in verse 7 they say, go your way and tell. Go and tell. So simple. Come and see that the Lord is good in His Bible, in His church. And then go and tell others that Christ is alive. We're at a crossroads of history. And we cannot consult a dead prophet. We cannot consult someone whose grave is still on earth and their bones are held. We consult Jesus who is not in the garden tomb. He is not here. An empty tomb. And as we look for the Lord, we must believe that He will remove the stones in our path and we are asked to give up the spices as He removes the stones in our path that we may find the true saint, Jesus Christ, our Savior. The story of stones and spices is to lead us to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And like Wilberforce, we need to help others leave the slavery of sin and the freedom that we have in Christ. Go and tell, the angel said, go tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before them into Galilee. There shall ye see him. We get to see Jesus. We get to hear Jesus. Oh, what a joy to see that Christ is soon returning. Please, Come and see and go and tell. Believe that He will remove the stones and you need to give up the spices to be with your Savior. May the Lord bless you. Amen. A blessed Sabbath to everyone. We will praise the Lord with hymn number 194. 194. It is titled, Heir of the Kingdom. We are heirs to the Kingdom of God. Heir of the Kingdom 194.
Let's arise and sing, please. One hundred ninety-four. Heir of the kingdom, O themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth which was crucified, he is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said.
our gracious Heavenly Father. We thank you for the opportunity what you have given us to gather together and praise your name. Please bless your word and bless the brother who is presenting us uh, that. And please uh, help us uh, uh, through your Holy Spirit to understand and to follow on in our daily basis. Please uh, give us strength because we are uh, powerless, but you are powerful. Mm -hmm. And remain with us. Forgive our sins and mistakes. And uh, help us uh, all over the world for your children to, to raise in, up spiritually uh, with us and to, to praising your name in all our life. All the things we ask in the dear name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be we want to welcome a number of you today to our worship service. Very happy to have Sister Wendy Eaton with us from Canada. And we're very happy also to have with us Pastor Laszlo and his wife and his wife's cousin and his son David. May the Lord bless you richly. And on this rainy day in Cedar Town, I hope that there will be sunshine in our souls. We have fellowship lunch today, and you're all invited to accompany us here in the fellowship hall. I have a story for the children. If they will come forward, I want to tell them a story. We're going to sing hymn number 34. Tell it to Jesus, please. Tell it to Jesus. Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Let's arise. Hymn 34. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus
Our Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We're thankful, Lord, that you came to this planet to save us. That we may eat of the tree of life again. Help us to seek you like those women of Galilee. Help us, Lord, to pursue our course and not to be disheartened because of the great stones. Oh, Father, help us to look upon Jesus and help us to be faithful messengers of the three angels' message to come and see and to learn for ourselves the message of salvation and to go and tell the world that Jesus is alive and that He will return. Now be with the children here. Be with our visitors. Be with those that are absent. And be with every service that is conducted in Your name. We pray for the sick that You will be with Richard, Lord. Put Your healing hand upon him. Be with others that are in bed, Lord, under disease, that you will be a comfort and a great physician to them. And those that are lonely, that you may be their great companion. And now sanctify us on your Sabbath. Help us to forgive those that sin against us, even as you forgive us, Lord, for sinning against you. For this we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. We will collect the offerings and tithes at this time, please. Offerings and tithes. And I'm going to ask um, Kyla, please. Kyla and Maya, can you both come here? Collect the offerings and tithes. Start from the back and you work forward, okay? Thank you very much. May the Lord bless every cheerful giver. So let us arise and sing our closing song. Hymn number 53, please. Lord, dismiss us with blessing. 5-3, please. Five three fifty three. Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Fill our hearts with joy and peace. Let us each thy love possessing triumphant redeeming bring. Oh, refresh us. Oh, refresh us, traveling through this wilderness. Thanks we give an adoration for thy gospel's joyful sound. May the fruits 
of thy salvation in our hearts and lives abound. Ever faithful, ever faithful, to the truth may we be found. Let us remain standing, please, to receive the benediction. On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. You may be seated, please, for a silent prayer. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. We may step outside.